Well, I'm going to get us started. Pastor Aaron, would you pray for us as we begin? Sure. Father, we thank you for this time together, and we thank you, dear God, for your grace and your mercy, that your grace is always sufficient, and your mercies are new every morning. And uh, Lord, we uh, thank you for uh, uh, the book of Revelation. We thank you, dear God, for uh, making us your sons and daughters, and thank you, dear God, for uh, just being uh, the one who who holds us and keeps us, and uh, the one who, who is... Uh, the author and finisher of our faith. And we find that, dear God, in Revelation, that you you finished the story that you started, dear God. And so, Lord, we thank you for your, your promises and your faithfulness to us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Well, Pastor Aaron, incredible sermon again on Sunday. I'm feeling incredibly blessed that we have two great preachers to hear from, you and Pastor George, and what an incredible series for Advent. I can't remember when I have been able to sit under preaching where we were able to look from the beginning of the book to the end and understand where Jesus fits in the midst of the great story of scripture. And I had wanted to start with a phrase that is very present throughout the Bible, but especially in Revelation, and you emphasize it on Sunday. We talked about God dwelling with his people. And I know we're familiar with that phrase, but you underlined it for us. And I wonder if you could expand more on really what's intended by that phrase and how is that intended to be different than the way God is with us now? Thanks, Chris. I, th I think that was the, the thing that leaped out at me the most as I uh, read through Revelation. And um, But when you read the Genesis story, you see God uh, dwelling in the garden with, with Adam and Eve, that God is you know, walking in the cool of the day, uh, Adam does not have to hide himself from God uh, originally. And um, uh, as a result of sin, uh, God being holy could not dwell with Adam, could not dwell in the garden with Adam and Eve anymore. Uh, and so you see this longing for humanity to be with God and to see God, but you also see this longing of God to, to dwell with humanity. And so, and, and all through scripture, you see, you know, Moses wanting to see God and God says, I can't, you can't see me uh, in my fullness. So you have to see a portion of me. Uh, you, you see this longing, the, the reason the temple exists is because God wants to dwell with his people and, and the people of God want to dwell with him. And so you see the, the, the Solomon's temple, you see the synagogue, you see the church. So all of the, the church is God's house. He says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. So there's this, this desire, those of us who are true children of God, we want to dwell with God and God wants to dwell with us. And so we see the fulfillment of that in the new Jerusalem. That, that's the reason there's no... The temple is no longer necessary because it was a signpost to a greater reality of who God is. Mm. And, and so in, in many ways, we shouldn't be surprised that we're dissatisfied with our inability to know God. That, that in some ways, what you're saying is that there's a, a creational urge in us to know God, but because of the world that's in between period, it doesn't allow us to know him the way we're designed to. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I think that, you know, you know, even in, in, in John's letters, there seems to be uh, in John's mentality or, or what we call Johannine theology, that John uh, paints this picture of, of us, uh, of humanity or, or Christians wanting to be in the presence of God, you know, and sin is that one thing that keeps us uh, separated from God, but Jesus you know, the disciples dwelled with Jesus. They, they spent 24 hours a day with him. And Philip asked the question, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus said, how long have I, how, how long have I been with you and you not understood that when you've seen me, you've seen the Father? So th there's this, this, if we want to desire to be with Jesus, we desire to be with God, yeah. you know, because Jesus is God. You said something in your sermon that I thought was captivating. You said a lot of things that were captivating, but this one idea, it was that you talked about 
Genesis and Revelation really being bookended for us in the scriptures. Could you expand on what you meant by that? Well, it, it has a lot of implications. The, the main thing I, I wanted to show was the continuity between Genesis and Revelation, that there's a, there's a theodrama, as uh, uh, Grant Osborne uh, points out, that there's a th theodrama in scripture, that God has a story and our story is intricately tied to his story. And Adam being the first man and Eve being the first woman. So you have this, this uh, as N.T. Wright says, um, that the new Jerusalem is not, is not a plan B, it's actually plan A. <laughs> that God wants to dwell with his people. And so you see uh, what happens in Genesis is not when man messed up, God says, well, oh, I guess I'll come up with a plan B now. No, God always had, there was always a plan A, you know. And so I, I, when, when, when I read Genesis, it, Revelation helps me to understand Genesis better. And Genesis helps me to understand Revelation better. Yeah. That God made a promise. Uh, you know, when we look at Genesis 3.15, uh, which we call it the proto-euangelion, the first sign of the gospel. Uh, so we see God making a promise and God is fulfilling that promise uh, through the story, the great, that you know, he calls Abraham, Abraham uh, a family and Abraham becomes a family and then a family becomes a nation. And then this nation, this story continues and then the Gentiles are drafted in. And so in Revelation, we see the, the, the culmination of that. So um, it's a bookend in the sense that um, it really is the front cover and the back cover. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you see God making His promises come to fruition in Revelation. It also strikes me that we're looking at a um, a linear direction of time. That this is not circular, but that God is moving. You you really there was an underlying theme of everything you preached on Sunday. We're moving to an end, a glorious end that we're not to fear or regret, but rather there'll be a fulfillment and in some ways an escape. So this idea of linear time, the idea of being a bookend, I thought was really helpful to understand that we're moving in a direction. We can participate in a direction and we can even anticipate it uh, because it leads to someplace great. So I thought that was really helpful. Yeah, you know, I think just to add to that, Chris, I think one of the things that Michael Gorman says in this book and N.T. Wright says as well, he talks about revelation for, for everyone in his commentary. He says, we historically, and, and, and a lot of this comes as a result of fundamentalism, uh, how we interpret revelation and, and dispensationalism and pre-trib, post-trib and all of these different ways of interpreting revelation, we miss the big picture of revelation. And it's really about, it's ultimately about Jesus uh, bringing God's kingdom down on earth. You know, that, that the new Jerusalem is heaven coming down on earth. And it's not me escaping earth, but it's Jesus bringing about victory on earth and bringing down New Jerusalem. Because he said, I saw New Jerusalem coming down. It's not about us going up. It's about God coming down mm. and dwelling with us. Okay, that, that prompts this question that I hadn't planned on. I'm going to ask it to you anyway. So it strikes me that, that it is easy to fear the end because um, for a lot of different reasons. Why do you think we do that? I mean, I've heard people say that I don't want the world to end. I, you know, I come back Jesus, but not yet. And why do you think it, it, the, the, the end you're describing, God dwelling with his people is pretty glorious. Why are we so afraid of it, do you think? You know, I can only speak for myself. I think we're all afraid of the unknown. Um, I think that there's a sense where even, even as, as difficult as it is sometimes to live on planet earth, uh, we know earth, you know, we, yeah. we, we reside here. Uh, this is, this is our, this is where we were born. So we, we, it, it seems to me that it, it's comfortable, you know, it's comfortable to be on earth. And so, um, and 
I believe we think, you know, in my own mind, going to heaven means the ultimate change you got to make, you know. But here, here's the thing. The, the goal is to have a New Jerusalem ethics before we get to New Jerusalem. It's the same way with the children of Israel to have a, a promised land ethics before they get to the promised land. And so the same is the case with us as Christians is that we are to live this New Jerusalem ethical behavior, following Christ and following and, and living under the Lordship of Christ now before the great city comes down. Well, I, I definitely want to get there and, and I want us to unpack that more. But the first thing before we get there, you had mentioned on your sermon that we lost so much in Genesis. By Genesis 3, the fall is coming and we've lost relationship with God, with one another. Can you expand on the significance of that last? I know that we'd all agree with that. Yes, you know, we sinned for relationship with God, but sometimes I feel like we we are so used to the loss, it doesn't feel like loss anymore. And I wonder if you could expand more on the implications of that loss and what loss looks like around us in our daily life. You know, and this has always been in, in my, my theology in terms of when I, when I read Genesis, you know, there are three things, three major things that happened to Adam and Eve. And one is Adam's relationship with God was severed. That uh, God, he could no longer commune with God the way he used to. Um, secondly, Adam's relationship with Eve was severed. He he, he didn't understand Eve anymore. He no longer understood his wife. And, you know, God says that there's going to be in, enmity between you and her now. Uh, and then thirdly, his relationship to creation. Uh, Adam could no longer go, go over to the bear and pet him. He, he could no, no longer go to the lion and, and pet the lion. Uh, he, he, he would, his relationship with creation and the ground you know, he, uh, he, he's going to have to really work hard now. He's going to have to separate weed from, t from tears now. So the, the, the curse affected every aspect of Adam's relationship with God, with Eve, even with his sons, you know, with Cain and Abel, and with the ground and creation. So when I said, when I said that, I, what, I'm, what I was implying is that Adam, Adam's relationship was severed on, on multiple levels. He lost a lot of, he lost everything, uh, humanity, you know, that, and, uh, but God's grace, but there was, God's grace showed up. God went looking for Adam, asking Adam, where are you? Uh, and began to, because uh, Adam was still created in the image of God, but now because of the effects of sin, um, he did not have uh, the perfection of that, that, the innocence of it, but he did not have the, the he was, his image was, was uh, distorted. Mm -hmm. uh, his image, humanity's image was distorted. We don't understand ourselves anymore. So it strikes me that you're describing a condition that we have all inherited. Yes. And so the question is, how do we, how are we supposed to live in this world? And you mentioned also that um, that our world in some ways is defined by death. How are we supposed to live in this world with this sense of dissatisfaction or unease? Because in some ways, the world's not the way we were created. It was not, it's not, we're not in a world that we were created to live in. So how do we live with that without and be content look forward to the future, not try to make the world as something that it's not, not pretend that it's, I don't know if you understand what you're saying, but, and it, maybe you could speak even to the issue of lament in this. Yeah, you know, when the, the, there was an aha moment for me was, as I began to prepare for this message. And it was that, um, how did the first century Christians feel, um, and especially during the, especially the seven churches and they're under the Greco-Roman empire 
and they they're living under an emperor who has a god complex and anyone who doesn't bow down to him um, should be killed and they were viewed as cannibal cannibals uh, they're talking about eating the body and drinking the blood of christ and so you have all of the you have this this madman who who is the emperor and he's 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 over the Greco-Roman world. And uh, so I'm asking the question, you know, how did they feel? Why did John, why did God reveal this to John and gave this to John to encourage the seven churches? Uh, what kind of conditions were they living in? Um, surely as, as, as they began to, as, as, they begin to look at scripture and read scripture. And John had, John, whenever, when John came back out of this state and, and went back to the seven churches and this letter was read, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't read like Revelation chapter one, it, the whole book was read. So it, it was like they sat there and John, that, le that letter was read, the whole letter was read. And it was to encourage them that the alternative to the Roman Empire was the New Jerusalem. Uh, God wasn't God wasn't promising promising them that they were going to ex escape martyrdom, but He was saying to them that the alternative to the Roman Empire is Jerusalem, and that was their greatest hope. That was their greatest hope. Um, uh, what what Michael Gorman points out is he talks about civil religion in his in his book and he talks about the the idea of a Christian nation is somewhat deceptive for us as Christians because we have more hope we we view the Christian this Christian nation as a New Jerusalem and yeah. and we have we have wedded ourselves to this this um, fairy tale of a nation, you know, that uh, that this that this nation is is the is somewhat uh, of a new Jerusalem of a promised land, and uh, and so in other nations that experience much more uh, persecution, Christians experience much more persecutions. They long for the new Jerusalem more than we do, because we're so comfortable. In America, well, and it strikes me that uh, we need to bring up the question of race in this because if you're a majority culture person in the U.S., yes, you, as a white male, older white male, it is possible for me to create a world where I'm advantaged. And while I know my world isn't perfect, and that's one of the lies that you can deceive yourself with, yeah. but you can create a world that you become it becomes normative for you yes. to have advantage to have access to have high comfort yeah and then pretend that that's normative and that it's god given yes right and so then what you're describing is that's a falsehood and you talked to me in your sermon about the con the danger of confusing your resources with the source of life that's right could, right. why don't you could you expand on that a little bit and just maybe tie that how we understand kind of race issues in the U.S.? Yeah, I, I think, you know, we in, in America, we we're, we're so used to making a uh, making a living that we're so we're so used to pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We're so used to this. I got mine, you get yours mentality or this individualism that uh, that's really uh, so, uh, so, so prevalent in, in our in American culture um, and the American dream. And so we tend to think that uh, these, these resources that we have, we live for these things. You know, we, we live, we, we live for these resources and they become a form of idolatry. Yeah. You know, our education, our careers, um, our homes, our money, it, it becomes a form of idolatry. And so we end up, um, as Neil Postman talks about in his book, 
amusing ourselves to death mm -hmm. that as as Americans, we have amused ourselves to death. You know, we we watch television, uh, we 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 entertain ourselves to the nth degree, and um, so it, there there's this there's this uh, you know this I this well this we are fixated on pleasing ourselves more than pleasing God. And so ultimately we begin to worship the gifts more than we worship the giver. And uh, until we put things in a proper perspective, then we'll, we, we'll, then new, new Jerusalem will become more desirable to us and dwelling with God will become more desirable to us. So that is just a critical issue. So <laughs> if I don't yearn for the new Jerusalem, yearn for God more, than the life I have now, then I, it sounds like what you're saying is, yeah. I create religion as recreation, not as life. Yes, exactly. You, 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 said, it better, you said it better than me. No, yeah. I didn't. Yeah. That's so, a, so I, I, want to exp, I want us to expand that conversation because we've, we've had this conversation numerous times before. What kind of spiritual life is required that we might then yearn for the new Jerusalem more than the life we've created here. What, what kind of a spiritual life must you have in order to go there? You know, I think Paul, Paul talks about um, being um, unclothed in this world and wanting to be clothed with Christ. And he talks about this the spiritual clothing, you know, so that we will not, so that we will not be found naked when Christ comes back. You know, Pastor George talked about it last week, you know, and I, and I, I alluded to it this week, but I, the idea is to, to focus more on uh, the New Jerusalem than we do on America. To focus more on the things that are unseen than the things that are seen. Um, uh, N.T. Wright talks about that everything that we see, the sun, the moon, the temple, uh, lights, everything points to a greater reality. Um, the temple pointed to a greater reality. Don't get fixated on the temple. Yep. Don't get fixated on the sanctuary. We yep. talked about this, this this summer, you know, about um, orientation, disorientation, and new orientation. Uh, don't, don't get fixated on the things that are seen. Don't, don't um, allow things that are seen to become a vice to you. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think to me, the, 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 the kind of life that, that, um, that prepares us for this new Jerusalem is a life that detaches out that we put things in a proper perspective. We detach ourselves from, from the things of this world, not saying that we can't enjoy the world and enjoy the things in the world, but don't let it become a vice and a form of idolatry. And it's so easy to happen. It, it, yeah. Because if, if we get, if we get um, Michael Gorman, he just, he just does a great job in explaining how we as Christians in America we, we will take something secular and evil in the world and make it sacred, you know? Scary. Yeah, and, 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 and he talks about it in terms of, uh, of our political system, you know? At best, our, our democracy is still a man-made system. At, at best, yeah. it's still, it's still a, a fallen, distorted system uh, and so why, why do we get so angry over political systems? Because it's become a form of idolatry. We wear it too close to the vest. Yeah. And so um, somebody has put a question in the chat I'm going to get to, but I want to ask this question first. So how do you know when you've made something you own, you're looking at, or you believe an idol? When you can't let it go. When you can't, when yep. you can't let it go, it, it, it's, it's, if it's more valuable to you 
then uh, then your life with Christ, if, if if it separates you from Christ, you know, I you know I, when I was at the former church I, I pastor, there were there were a couple of you know there were families who had children who played soccer and played softball and baseball and and they played it on Sundays, you know, and there was one one family that came up to me and said, you know, uh, Reverend Williams, you 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 uh, you convicted me one Sunday that I was teaching my child what's that playing soccer is more valuable than worshiping the Lord. Wow. And, and it, it was like, you know, he's, he said it was, it was eye-opening. It was eye-opening to him that he had, he was conditioning his child to neglect worship and, 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 and show by his behavior to show him that Soccer, uh, extracurricular activities is more important than worship. Yeah, what you can't let go of is probably what you're worshiping. That's yeah. a powerful image. Do you know, I was in this conversation with someone, uh, someone who is um, Caucasian, and we were talking about issues of um, identity and um, what it meant to uh, be a person of advantage. And they were really struggling with the idea that um, somehow their skin color gave them advantage in the culture. And the thing that we talked a lot about was Mark chapter eight. Mm. So uh, when Jesus says, if you want to come after me, you have to deny yourself, take your cross and follow me. You have to give up your life in order to save it. And I've been thinking a lot about, and that's really what you're saying. It, if I'm not willing to give up this thing that I find my identity in, that I think is so fundamental to me for the sake of following Jesus, then I'm probably worshiping my identity. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, you know, I think in, in even one of the things the Lord taught me has been teaching me is that, and this is just, this is just what God revealed to me personally that the church had become to me a form of idolatry, hmm. that the African American church had become a form of idolatry to me, that my identity was so rooted in being a black pastor in a black church um, that I elevated it more uh, above my relationship with Christ. This, this is what God was show, showing me. And, and the litmus test for me was, was I willing to walk away from it? Yep. Yep. Okay, well, I'm gonna ask this question. We could go a lot further into this, and we might. But somebody's asked, "So, how do you gain a perspective of the of the, uh, of the unseen? How can we be less focused on what's seen and develop a spiritual life where we're really thinking about the unseen, thinking about God?" Well, you know, it's it's what uh, what um, C.S. Lewis, you know, talks about the Christian imagination. That when you read the scriptures. Um, Imagination and faith goes hand in hand, um, and I, I I just love the imagination of C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien, but it's rooted in Scripture that that that, that what they wrote, everything that they wrote, has had its foundation in Scripture. Mm -hmm. So it, it to to me it has a lot to do with when we read Scripture, and even the symbolisms, um, because we we haven't been to heaven yet, we haven't been to the New Jerusalem yet, but but John has painted a picture, Paul paints a picture, Peter paints a picture, all the prophets are painting these pictures, and we have to um, have faith in what they see and what God has shown us in scriptures. So I, I, to me, it has a lot to do with, with envisioning what, what, what God is saying in, his, in, in the word and what, he, what he's saying in the Bible. Every Sunday, when I preached this Sunday, I had this, I began to, you know, my wife will tell you, I was, I was, I was um, as I was re preparing for this message, some of the songs that I used to sing growing up as a kid that I didn't really know, I didn't know what they meant until I got older. But we used to sing this old song when I was in a little uh, junior choir, uh, uh, I want to walk in Jerusalem just like John. I want to be ready, mm -hmm. you know, 
I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready when he comes. I'm trying. I'm trying to get my house in order so I can walk, walk in Jerusalem just like John. I didn't know what that meant when I was growing up as a kid. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's got its foundation in Revelation. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about the, the prayer life that you've experienced, the prayer life that has developed in your life as a way of connecting with God, kind of healthy uh, faith, healthy Christianity. Because you talked a lot about this this summer, and I'd just like to review some of that. Talk about a little bit of how you've developed your prayer life and what it's like. You know, you know, I, I gather with with the uh, with a group of men every every morning, Monday through Saturday, and um, we pray together, we we fellowship together. Uh, but what God was God God was also teaching me is, even before I pray with them, I need to pray. I need to talk to Him. You know, before I get on the phone, I mean, get on Zoom and pray that um, the priority of my relationship with him supersedes me praying with them. Uh, the priority of my relationship with my wife, uh, the, my relationship with God supersedes my relationship with my wife. Um, so for me, uh, God taught me early uh, in my in my uh, calling to ministry, I remember God saying to me uh, uh, on my knees one morning, he said, Aaron, you will accomplish more on your knees than you ever will on your feet. Yeah. And, and God has proven that to me over and over again. I, I'm, I'm not the smartest person in the world. Uh, I'm, I'm not the, the, the most intuitive person in the world, but when I get on my knees, God drops wisdom in me. Mm -hmm. he, he, he reveals things to me that I never would know, you know, and it's all because, you know, I, I remember getting on my knees one day and God says, I, I want you to go to seminary. And I kept saying, Lord, I don't, I, I don't want to go. I don't want, can I go to seminary right here in Augusta? Mm -hmm. And I wrestled with God for three years before I went to Dallas. Uh, I wanted to go to Duke. I wanted to go to Princeton. Um, and then, uh, when I was in Dallas, uh, and a graduate from, from seminary and I wanted to go back to Georgia, go back to the East coast. And the Lord says, no, you're not going back home. I'm, I'm sending you to Seattle. Uh, and God has always revealed to me in my prayer life, what he wants me to do. And, uh, and then, uh, talk me out of what I want to do. You know, it's kind of like, I want to go where I'm comfortable. I want to be where I'm comfortable. Uh, I'm an introvert by nature. I, I didn't want to preach, uh, but God called me to preach. Um, I tried to run from it for a few years. So it's to me, it's my prayer life. God has directed me uh, in my prayer life. He has uh, opened doors for me that, you know, that I, I mean, how did I end up at UPC? You know, I, you know, I, I was talking to a, a, a guy who was my boss in at Dallas Seminary in the bookstore. His name is Kevin Stern. And um, when he graduated from Dallas Seminary in 1994, maybe earlier, he applied for a job as a youth pastor at, UP, at UPC. Wow. And so when I told him that I was going to UPC, he said, what? <laughs> he, said, he said, I applied for a job there back in the early 90s. And so he was shocked that I was going to UPC. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't even know where UPC was. <laughs> so part of the lesson of this is if you pray, you never know where you'll end up, which, you know, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I understand. I mean, look, at, look, at you, look at your story. Look I know. At, That's why I'm laughing. <laughs> So I want us to go back and talk about New Jerusalem ethics and New Jerusalem values, that we're not there yet. God has painted a picture for us, but you pressed hard that we should be living as New Jerusalem people. Talk about that. What did you mean by that? Well, it, well, it goes back to what I was saying about, you know, the promised land that, you know, the, the children of Israel 
they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and, and those who were under uh, over 20 uh, did not make it into the promised land because uh, they could not get Egypt out of them. You know, the, the Egyptian mindset, uh, God could not allow them to go into the promised land with an Egyptian mentality. Uh, and, and so I, I, I look at, look at that in, in many ways, it, it mirrors uh, us as Christians today is that uh, the closer we get to Christ and the closer that we follow Christ, and the, the closer we get, the more clarity he gives us and the more we are formed into his image. And walking with Christ prepares us for New Jerusalem. I mean, the life of Christ, the works of Christ, the words of Christ. Uh, Peter said, let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. Uh, and, and so Paul talks about this as well, the renewing of your mind. All of this is, is, is about preparing us for that greater reality, life beyond the, the, the physical and the visible things that we see right now. I, I'm really stuck on this image. They couldn't get Egypt out of them. That is an incredible, powerful image. That that phrase, I, I think about um, being so bound yeah. by the world around me that I can't dwell in the kingdom, right? I can't do kingdom work because I'm so bound to the earth around me, to the world around me. I can't get it out of me. That's that's powerful. Um, I, I wonder if you you talk you use this phrase that really has captured me. They were called to be not a cul-de-sac of blessing, but a conduit of blessing. What did you mean by that? Not to be hoarders. You know, God, God often blesses us to be a blessing to someone else. And um, sometimes we think what God, the blessings that God placed in our laps are for us. And many times it's for others. Uh, and we, we're to be uh, a conduit to pass that blessing on to someone else. You know, this is not for me. This is for you, you know. Um, and, and in many ways, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's like the man who had the talents, the man who bared his talent, you know. And God, God says, you know, when he comes back, I never intended for you to bury your talent that you, you, you're supposed to, it's supposed to multiply 30 fold, 100 fold. And to me, that, that, that parable points, paints the picture of not being a cul de sac and being a conduit of God's blessing. Because when you're a conduit of God's blessing, God blesses you with more. Yeah. He blesses you with more. Uh, we, in, in America, I think, you know, we have a, compared to other countries, most of us are rich in America. I mean, we we are rich. We have more than than what we need, more than what we need. Uh, there, there should not be a homeless person in America. It, it just it just you know it grieves my heart every time I I, I drive past a, a homeless embankment, a, a camp. Um, we had a, a hotel right here in Renton where. Uh, the city council in Renton said, that's uh, designate this hotel for, in, origi originally it's for people who had COVID. Mm -hmm. And so then uh, after that, you know, well, it went down for a while and it's back up now, but um, homeless people were staying in the hotel. And there, there were people here in Renton who were, were not aware that it was being used the way it was. And so now they're, they're wanting to kick the homeless people out yeah. of the hotel. Yeah. So it just baffles me. It, it baffles me. You have a vacant hotel, nobody's in it, and you don't want the homeless staying in it. Yeah. But don't you think there is this sense of, I think we will live with a lot of fear of losing what we have, right? I mean, and, and there's legitimate fears about that, but there is when we think about what it means to be a conduit of blessing, that I think then the question we must be asking is, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? And then actually listen for the answer. Yeah. Yeah, so, you're right. 
you're right. Uh, you know, because uh, I th there there are times like <laughs> I've given. Let me see. I think I've given two cars away, uh, mm -hmm. and um, and one time it was, it was a person who uh, who moved to Dallas from from uh, the C Katrina, and we had my wife and I. We had two cars, and um, the car had been given to me. And the Lord says, "Give that car away," and I gave it to someone. And years later, I met the lady who we gave that car to. Um, and she, you know, thanked us for, for giving her the car. She needed the car for a job. And uh, when I left, when I left Dallas to come here, we, we had two cars. I gave one away uh, to a seminary student. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it was, uh, it, you know, I just, it was given to me. So I gave it away. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to pay for the car. It was given to me. So um, some of us have four or five cars in our in our garage, you know, just parked, you know, not being used. Yeah. There's something about, um, well, I, I'm gonna ask this question because it's a phrase you use a lot. And then I'm gonna talk more about New Jerusalem values, but you use the phrase, the Lord told me a lot. Mm -hmm. How do you know when the Lord's telling you things? <laughs> Over the years, I, and this is a long, because I used to always ask the question, Lord, how do I know this is you? And, I, you know, um, for a long time, when my grandmother spoke, it was like the voice of God. Mm -hmm. My grandmother spoke, whatever she told me, that was like the voice of God. I mean, she, and then one day, um, my grandmother asked you know, when I moved to Dallas, my grandmother tried to talk me out of going, moving to Dallas. And I said, uh, Grandma, I love you, um, but I've been wrestling with God for three years over this. And uh, it's time for me to obey God and move to Dallas. Um, and usually I can tell when, God, when, when, when the Lord tells me to do something, it makes me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason I always use the quote, there's no growth in your comfort zone as there, there's no comfort in your growth zone. Uh, so usually that, that's usually how I can tell when God is telling me to do something. Even if he tells me to apologize to you, Chris, or apologize to Michelle, I'm uncomfortable with that because of my pride and my arrogance. But my humility and uh, the, the, the submitting myself to God, not my humility, but submitting myself to God, God says, do the right thing, you know? So to me, that, that, that's how I know when, when, when I'm hearing the voice of God, when, he, when the Lord called me to preach, I said, but Lord, I'm an introvert. I, I, don't, I, I don't have a way with words. I stutter. Um, and God um, just, it, it was irresistible. The calling was just so, so powerful on me that I couldn't help but preach. So I think this is really important. And this has to do with living as New Jerusalem people, living in this in-between world where we're not, we're in the now and the not yet. Following the calling of God, who that will make us different in the world. So Clearly, as you keep listening to the Lord, he keeps pulling you to places where you either don't fit or it's a new challenge. You can't believe you're here over and over again. So the impulse, I think, as human beings is that if we feel uncomfortable, it must be not from God. You're saying the exact opposite. So how do we have peace with God, even when his in obedience to him, we're called to do some things we're uncomfortable with? or even makes us disturbingly unhappy? You know, the, the scripture that really I cling to often is, you know, James, James 4, 8, where God, God gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. Uh, submit to God, resist the devil. He will flee from you. That That's a, 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 a verse that I, that I constantly meditate on because I, I, I want to be... I want to be 
in God's grace. I want to be in good graces with God. <laughs> you know, I, I desire to be in good graces with God. And I said, Lord, keep me humble. Keep me humble. Because I always want to be in good graces with you. And I have found, you know, I've been preaching, preaching for 32 years now. And uh, I have friends who have gotten out of the ministry, friends who have fallen. Um, but I, I've always, that's always been my prayer, Lord, keep me humble because I want to always be in, in good graces with you. And God has been faithful. Yeah. He's been faithful. Just a word to everyone who's listening. If you have questions for Pastor Aaron, you can put those in the chat. We'll make sure that I have lots more questions, but I want to make sure if you have questions you'd like to ask him to make sure that you put this in the chat and we'll get those to him. It strikes me that as we're talking about um, the values of a new Jerusalem, you did what I thought was a very moving invitation to commit to Jesus. And you talked about folks that are simply dating him. And I wonder if you could expand on that. What did you mean by that? And what's the difference between what you describe as dating Jesus and being committed to him? You know, it, it, the, the, the imagery of that is, you know, you know when, when you're dating someone, you, you, you pick them up, you take them out, you wind and down them, and you drop them, you drop them back off. You know, we, we, we treat Christ like that in terms of that's, that's, that's imagine that the, that the church is is Christ's home. It is Christ's home. It's, 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 it's the house. We come we come to church. We 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 date Christ. We we date him, and we we drop him off, and we don't take him back with us into the world. We don't we don't take him with us home. We don't take him take him home with us. We don't take him to work with us. We don't take him. Uh, uh, we don't we don't stay with him. You know, and so the idea there is, is that when you're when you've settled down with Jesus, he goes everywhere with you. I was talking to a lady today and she had a, a beautiful, um, a beautiful uh, lab. Uh, he's, he's, he was a comfort dog, but he was just friendly. He was so friendly that when I when I walked by him, he just looked up at me like this. <laughs> And I said, that's such a beautiful dog. She said, yes, he, he is. I, I take him everywhere with me, you know. And, and I was like, <laughs> that was a perfect Im image of how Christ, we should be with Christ and Christ be with us. Abide, abide in me and I abide in you. I will abide in you. And so I think to me, that's settling down. There are a lot of people who, who, uh, they know about Christ. They know of Christ. They even, they attend church, but they don't know Christ. You know, they, they don't have a relationship with, where they have settled down with Christ because settling down with Christ in one, in some ways it will make you feel comfortable. In other ways, it makes you feel uncomfortable because yeah. you can't do whatever you want to do when you settle down with him. There's an image that, um, when I worked at uh, University of San Diego, Catholic University, and was on the staff there and began to learn about the mass. And um, one of the things that I was always overwhelmed with when I went to mass is this image that um, after you've heard Old Testament, New Testament, you've worshiped, you've prayed, then you're, and you've confessed, and you've prepared for the Eucharist. And Catholics believe that it's the real presence, yeah. that in that moment, you're receiving Jesus in your body. And the thing that always got to me is I've watched I always felt like alarm bells should go off, warning lights, because there was a sense that they were being invited to ingest Jesus and let him loosen their bodies where they couldn't control him. Mm. And when I listen to you, that's what I think of every time, that you're inviting Jesus into the innermost rooms of your life yes. where he, you can't control him. That's right. It's rather than having a controlled relationship with Christ, rather than having a full open relationship with Christ, where he does what he wants that's right. for our good and for his glory. Yes. That's a different experience. And that's what I hear in you all the time. Yes. But it, I ache for the folks who don't know that. Yeah. And they're coming to church. And we had a someone come to faith 
a month ago at UPC who described his experience after 20 years at UPC. I felt like I'd been sitting in the ante room all this time mm. and I didn't know how to get in. Wow. And I, I listened to you, I think, yeah, being on the inside, that's, yeah. that's the place to be. Amen. Amen. That's the place to be. Amen. If, um, as you think about the times we're living in, and you think about the ethics of a new Jerusalem, if you had to pick, this is going to be an impossible question, so I just want to own that in the beginning, but if you had to pick one or two key ethical behaviors, you think in these this moment in time we should be adhering to as people of the new Jerusalem, what would they be? Well, that's, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I, to, 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 to me, the, the, the most important behavior right now as Christians is, um, I would say I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm leaning toward more toward just kindness. You know, there, there, there's, there's a lot of hatred, a lot of animosity, um, seeking to under, understand people first, uh, and then, then, then for them to understand you. But I think there's, there's a, there's a, we, we, we don't listen to one another well. Um, but I think kindness is, is a, is a major, um, behavior that we, we need to, really practice in this day and age, you know, because I mean, there's so much hatred, people on the, people uh, at the grocery store, people on the, on the streets, people blowing their horns, it's just, uh, and, and, and many times God convicts me, Aaron, you need to be more kind to people, people going, you know, we, we were at a, we were at a, a, a sandwich shop the other day, and this young man just just got very upset. We, uh, my wife was just asking a question and he just flew off the handle and walked out of the store. And, and I, I started looking at him. I said, he, he, he may be going through a lot. He could be going through a lot. We don't know what that young man is going through. You know, there's so much going on in the world. Um, so I, I, I do believe kindness makes a big difference right now. And it's, I mean, that's just one of my, it's so many I was going through my head, but that's what I was thinking about. And what would another one be? Pick two. I know it's a crazy question, but <laughs> kindness, the discipline of kindness, the gift of kindness. Uh, I, I, I would say um, in, ter in terms of, of, of our Christian re in relationships as Christians, uh, Submission, mutual submission. Okay, you have to expand on that. What do you mean by that? Well, pa Paul Paul talks about submitting to one another, and um, and and the the implication Paul is making is that um, that if we submit to one another, the 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 bond of of Christian unity and Christian love flows more freely. When we submit to one another, uh, and 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 when I see Christ in you, um, I'm able to hear you better. And when you see Christ in me, I'm I'm able to hear you better. Believe the best. I have to know that the Holy Spirit is working on you, and I and you have to know that the Holy Spirit is working on me. Amen. And uh, th that that that. The flow of the Holy Spirit is moves more freely in a community of humility and submission. It, it, it it's not it's not because it, submission doesn't mean that we don't hold one another accountable, but it's recognizing that we are connected, yeah. that we that that we are connected. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that that's a powerful powerful phrase the idea that we would actually see Christ in one another, value each other to the point we're willing to submit to one another in service to each other. Yeah. And the idea that the Holy Spirit has freedom to work. That's a powerful thing. Now, I yearn for that at UPC. 
And you and you know we were talking. You, we we've been doing this this series on the color of compromise, and uh, and it's been a wonderful class. But one of the things that I see God doing even in that class is this this um, this profound humility that we have in toward one another that we are able to listen and not judge one another. I think that there's. I mean, I feel it in the conversations that there's enough grace, virtual grace in, in, in the zoom room where we, where we, we where we're listening to one another. Um, I, I think that, you know, the church is at its best when we're submitting to one another. Yeah. Uh, when I see your gifts and, and let you use your gift freely, and you see my gifts and let me use my gift for you. It's not, not, it's not about me being, um, uh, you know, my, my friend, when he was pastoring a church, he, he, he didn't call himself the senior pastor. He called himself the senior servant. Mm -hmm. um, that was his title, senior servant. Um, he didn't get caught up in the titles. Yeah. 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 Do you know, in our last few minutes, I just wanted to, kind of bring up the color of compromise class because one of the things that in our conversation tonight you talked about being able to really deal with the truth about ourselves about our world about our kingdom um and being able to let go of false things so we can hold them to true things and i i just think one of the great things about the color of compromise that the gift of jeremy tisby is to be able to help us understand how the church has been complicit in the evils of racism in our country and which is not a critique of the Lord or his kingdom, but of early institutions. Yeah. And it strikes me that part of what you've been talking about tonight is that if we can face the truth, then we can hold on to Jesus and let him hold on to us. And it doesn't become an idol. And it strikes yeah. me that's really what you're doing in the color of compromise class. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's, you know, it's that, that your skin can become a form of idolatry. Yeah. The, the, the fact that, that you're white can be a form of idolatry. The fact that I, I'm black, I can make my skin color a form of idolatry and impose it on you and dehumanize you. Yeah. That, that's, the, the, the church became complicit to that, that, that uh, ideology. It yeah. became complicit to that. Yeah. And and people people for hundreds of years years have swam in that ideology. Yes. And um, one that I feel like one of the discipleship works in God, Christ's work in me is to recognize how much I've been raised in that ideology, whether I've held to it or not. You know, I come from a family that's pretty progressive and we've always valued diversity. And yet I recognize the more I learn, the more I have been raised up into that ideology yeah and so following jesus there's this deliberate um breaking down of that worship mode that's essential to my faith yeah and but it's painful yeah. right i mean it's just painful and i um which gets me the place of thinking well what does lamentation look like that's why i keep pressing you to yeah. ask about spiritual life so yeah. I can hold on to that and not on the pain or not avoid it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that the question that keeps coming up in our color compromise class is, what am I to what 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 should I do now that I know this? What what am I to do? And you know, I I stated one one Sunday, I can't answer that for you. I, I only God can tell you what to do. I I. I I can't answer it, you know. Um, it, it's uh, you know once you once you once you have been exposed or something has been revealed to you that you didn't know that you feel like you should have known. Yep. Um, because your story, my story, our stories are different. There are things that you've seen that I haven't seen, and there are things I've seen that you haven't seen, and. And we grew up in different eras and different geographical locations. So what God tells you to do is based on how you're wired and what God, just like when Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem, he saw the walls torn down. 
There were other people who went back to Jerusalem yeah. and they saw the walls torn down. But it says Nehemiah wept, he cried, and he prayed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he yep. prayed, you yep. know, and that's when, that's when God began to tell Nehemiah what to do. Yeah. Our hour is up. I can't believe it. This has been, as usual, just a great conversation. Um, again, I just want to thank you not only for the words tonight, but your preaching. What a gift to us as you lead us into the scriptures and in relation with God. And I just want to let everyone that this is going to be our last Talk Back Tuesday for this season. We'll start back up in January. We're taking a hiatus from now yeah. until uh, January 13th, uh, 12th, which is a Tuesday. So what a great way to end this time. And I, I want to ask that if you would pray and bless us, um, Pastor Aaron, as we finish this time. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Father, I just want to thank you for this time. Thank you for Chris and uh, his love for you, his love for UPC and um, his love for ministry and and I thank you for his friendship dear God and uh thank you for my brothers and sisters who are on this zoom call and and uh Lord we uh we're in this story together and uh Lord we uh we long for that day when there will be no more dying uh, no more crying we long for that day dear God where we'll have unfettered access to the throne of grace and the lamb will be there. And uh, we long for that day, day where we'll see you face to face. And uh, thank you, dear God, for, for uh, being the author and finish of our faith. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you once again, Pastor Aaron. Thank you for everybody who came tonight. Um, we pray that you have just a wonderful, wonderful Christmas, a great Advent. There's uh, encouragement you to see uh, Pastor uh, Nguyen on Thursday night at uh, 7, I believe it's 7.30 p.m. If you look on the Advent page on UPC, you'll find it. Pastor Nguyen was uh, in prison in Vietnam in solitary confinement. He's telling his story about how he came closer to God in those really trying times. So I encourage you to tune in on Thursday night. But again, Pastor Aaron, thank you so much and uh, many blessings. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. God bless y'all.